And good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and good whatever on earth it is where you are. Welcome to Coffee and Clausewitz episode V. That's five. Nice. Okay. We're on five, aren't we? I hope so now. Yeah, yeah, anyway, I've said it now. It's out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, there we go. No, seriously, thanks for, thanks for tuning in again. Um, this week, as mentioned last week, we will be doing the impact of gunpowder and... Um, on warfare in India and also the impact that interaction with uh, European, uh, what to call it, interlopers uh, had on uh, <laughs> diplomatic. diplomatic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's leave that. Um, <laughs> um, that will be more Barney's um, uh, bag for, mm -hmm. for this afternoon. It's the afternoon where we are, by the way. And uh, I will be, well, to be honest, I've got something of an easy job this week because I've got, because uh, my area will be uh, Indian warfare before the, um, before major interactions with uh, certainly Euro European um, interlopers. That's what I'm going to call them from here. Uh, so that's what I'm going to call them from here on out. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the Brexit half of our audience. Lost. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's everyone's just turned off now. Um, <laughs> and first thing I want to say on that is it's important not to think of uh, Indian political and military interaction with European um Colonizers, traders, whatever, whatever it is, prior to prior to about the 16th century, as the be all and end all, as the as the big break point between uh, the use of gunpowder and the not use of gunpowder. India is um, at this time is a highly has a, has a series of highly advanced, highly uh, highly bureaucratized and um, well put and well put together functioning states within what we would now call the subcontinent of India, interaction mm -hmm. with the Ottomans, with the Islamic um, and a Arabic um, uh, I don't call it empires necessarily, but um, it's, it's okay. contact, contact existed um, with a with countries, kingdoms, all, all over Central Asia and all into Europe and all across the Middle East. Ergo, gunpowder and the, um, and the discovery thereof was not new to uh, Indian uh, princes and, uh, and armies before about the 16th century, i.e. before the, uh, for the Europeans in whatever stripe uh, turn up on, on the subcontinent. It, oh okay. Um, oh yeah, they, they, they knew they knew about it, but this is what um, we um, this leads me into the next uh, little theme of my my talk is that there was a cultural aversion to it for much of the um, certainly the fifth certainly the fifteenth um, century, and it, indeed, like if we if we're looking at the Mughal uh, Empire, mm -hmm. uh, the the musket, for example, is looked down upon as a as a as a, as a weapon because there is uh because of the prime the, the primacy of uh the cavalry um it's kind of like oh, the, the, right. the similar dynamic to what we saw in europe um the traditional primacy of cavalry and kind of get getting amongst it in inverted commas um mm -hmm. equaled a sort of a socio socio and a cultural aversion amongst elites towards um not not uniformly, but um, enough mm. to stymie the uh, the implementation of uh, certainly infantry based um, gunpowder weapons like the musket, the um, other bus, uh, the uh, systems that we've um, uh, discussed pr previously in the series. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to tread too much on on your territory, but it's like it's the first battle of. Uh, of Panipat in 1526, where we start to see, um, and that this is all I'm going to say about this because I know this is where you're taking off. Um, no, no, I'm actually going before that, but that's fine. Okay, cool. Um, between uh, the 
uh, Mughal Empire and uh, under the forces of Baba and the Lodi din dynasty. Um, mm -hmm. And it's uh, the Baba's forces of the... Um, uh, that they that they have cannon basically, and uh, the Lodi right. and the Lodi dynasty and the Lodi dynasty don't, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, this is something that will probably occur certainly throughout the black this Black Powder series as we certainly ed edge into the nineteenth century that these weapons are so much more effective when the other guys don't have them. Um, really? Yeah, weirdly, weirdly. Now, but, no, um, just on on that point, I don't know much about the Mughals, but they're not indigenous to India, are they? No. No. no, no. So they don't have that. I say local. It's a huge place, but that local aversion to using gunpowder weapons. No, but they, they um, you, you, you're right. But they carve out enough of um, of a, a footprint within India to um, uh, in so in the in the north of India to geographically, um, cast those particular cultural aversions to uh, because they because they're the military because they're the military. Uh, power in the in the area, the mm -hmm. um, the the use of uh, muskets and uh, uh, whether it's flintlock or matchlock doesn't really mm. take off until the 18th century. Um, oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> I know. Wow. But, but, um, but here's the break point, as I've just mentioned, with the first battle of ba uh, Panipat in April uh, 1526. By the way. Um, Cannon does. It's that's used in a similar fashion to uh, um, what we see in uh, certainly in uh, East, Eastern Europe and in Europe. It's used for sieges. It's it's seen depressingly, and this this turns my stomach thinking about this. But it's uh, they liked it because it was very effective against war elephants. Oh yeah. Okay, dokie. Just I'll just let that sink in. That's, yeah, uh, just well, that, makes sense. That uh -huh. sink in. But so that's kind of a quick rundown of uh, why th why the uh, so sorry uh, no no I was just going to say are we actually looking at warfare in the broadest sense being quite similar to what it is in Europe in that you've got archers you've got foot soldiers with spears and swords yeah particularly the elite arm. Um, Absolutely, particularly archers. The bow, the bow has a, uh, a cr certainly across nor northern and, and eastern India has a real. Um, it's in Europe. It's a weapon system. In Europe, it's a weapon system. In uh, in uh, in India, for much of the what we, we would call the medieval period, and mm -hmm. I mean it's it has a real uh, central place what in um, the culture of warfare. Um, oh, right. As far as far as the suite of weapons that though that um, whether it's cavalry or infantry we're using, yeah, we're looking at. I mean, it's a we're looking at a very similar evolution of uh, weapon systems uh, to um, what we see in Europe with uh, swords, spears, maces, uh, daggers. Um, mm -hmm. Have a look. There um, is. Uh, Cavalry, yes. Foot soldiers, not so much. But that's again uh -huh. kind of kind of similar. Yeah. Um, lots of different types of bows. Um, the shark, for example, was a, uh, was actually a crossbow used by Afghan men from the region of shark. Um, oh. You uh, and they were they were used as mercenaries. Um, Uh, yes, all, all, all the all the all the all the usual suspects. The, the battle axes, uh, spears, uh, the uh, something called the balam, which was what we might call a halbard. It's sort of a, a spear and a pike. Um, oh right, okay. Uh, with a with a barbed head. Um, right. Uh, all of which could be uh, adopted for use by cal by um, cavalry or um, or infantry. Um, but I think what the, is interesting, certainly with the uh, the case study of the of the Mughal Empire and the cult and the cultural of it and this kind of cultural snobbery, almost if you like, toward, towards musket, yeah. is um, and we I can't remember if it was me or you who mentioned it. It was about two or three weeks ago that in order for a technology to be 
adopted and developed, there has to be a cultural seabed from where from where it can spring. Um, mm-hmm. it is from where there has to be some kind of take up within this uh, social and political culture in which it's found. As I, as yeah. I said at the start, as I said a, a few minutes ago, the existence of gunpowder cannon, uh, the new technologies that um, in Europe were absolutely known about. Um, yeah. In uh, in India, whether we're talking about the Marathas or the or the Mughals later on, mm-hmm. they just for one reason or another they they, they just don't use them. They don't. They, um, they're just not. Uh, they're not seen as either tactically applicable or culturally not culturally viable. Perhaps isn't the word isn't the word I'm I'm looking for. But it, they mm-hmm. don't gel with uh, yeah. with um, accepted modes and models of uh, warfare. Um, in that in their particular context, which is why uh-huh. not until the 18th century, um, after enough interactions with Brit- with the British and the French, that think that things start to change. I mean, we see um, sketches and uh, uh, ink paintings of um, Indian soldiers from the from the 19th century, not at, not necessarily in British or French ser- service, and then um, yeah. well, it's in the British service by that point. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and they're all carrying muskets, so that so there is so the shift does happen. It's just nowhere near as um, as quick and acute as the take up of gunpowder technology, whether in cannon form or in infantry or in musket form and in inverted commas for um, use by um, infantrymen, as it was in Europe. I mean, uh, uh, as we mentioned a, a few weeks ago, when gunpowder weapons turn up in. Um, Europe for the first time in sometime in the middle of the fourth in in the third or fourth decade of the fourteenth century, um, mm-hmm. for reasons that we discussed then, European leaders and um, uh, and and rulers take this technology and run with it. This doesn't happen so much in India. There are exceptions. Uh, I was, um, there are. Uh, various kind of mavericks and generals that try to get this stuff in, in introduced in uh, in a, on a more on a more majorita- uh, majoritarian basis amongst the amongst um, amongst uh, I don't want to say Indian forces because that that, that, that doesn't make sense no. but, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. but uh, whether it's the Mughal army the Maharatas or the uh, wh- wherever we are mm-hmm. um, it, it, it just doesn't happen in the to the same pay, at the same pace or with the same vigor as what we saw the take up of these weapons and this technology in Europe, um, and it, like as we discussed at the time in in Europe, there was cultural aversion to gunpowder weapons as well, but certainly by the elites and um, uh, yes, um, so it's it's a similar dynamic, but perhaps just may, maybe taken a bit. Uh, um, I wonder what the reason for that is. Well, I mean. I think it was in my first year history paper. There's a armies of bastions of conservatism discuss. Um, I think it's uh, there's definitely a space to be occupied by saying that you that the that soldiers generals are used to doing things in one way, and unless there is a desperately apparent reason why mm-hmm. we need to change with the. the uh, and this isn't just armies. This is an institutional. This is a human institutional mindset as well. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, definitely. And as I, as I mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago, if you look at uh, paintings of um, Mo- certainly Mughal soldiers from the nineteenth se- uh, from the nineteenth century, ever uh, that they're, they're using muskets by then. Yeah. So what what could what could have happened in the interim? It's uh, realised that the British. Uh, British forces, or, uh, or you know, by that point, there's been enough interaction with outside, with with outside forces and factors, to yeah. force enough people with, and have enough memories of um, uh, to reconsider or certainly consider revising their current mode of warfare if if they want to be successful. And that's again not uh, immediately assigning uh, a victory is a foregone conclusion to um, European style armies or 
uh, armies equipped with muskets mm, and, and muskets yeah, and yeah. powder because that is not the case. It was net and it was never the case. But um, mm. over time, the evolution of um, culturally and institutionally obviously took place to a um, deep enough extent to for force a change to um, the widespread adoption of, of gunpowder weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, so in summary, um, before the interactions with, uh, Europe, with uh, European interlopers, we're back there again, um, <laughs> the technology that is being taken and run with, whether it's cannon or um, muskets or infantry or cavalry um, based uh, gunpowder, gunpowder weapons, it's known about, it's just not taken up with the same uh, vigour in, uh, in India or on the subcontinent, wh in whichever polity we're talking about. But it is with artillery. Uh, the artillery d has, makes, a bit more, makes quite a lot more headway, with, uh, but not with, um, but not, yes, you, no, you're absolutely right, uh, but not uh, the infantry. Um, right. So it does sound like it's a kind of cultural... Um skew if you like and that the emphasis is on artillery maybe to such an extent that it's not financially viable to produce muskets May, i mean yeah maybe so because um artillery is used in a, i mean in a in a, re, in a range of in a range of sieges um this is a let me have a look. Sorry, I'm just going through my notes. That's all right. In, uh, yeah, in, uh, we've got 1514 at the Battle of uh, Chal Chaldaran. Um, mm -hmm. Barber, who, but who, we, who we mentioned just ago, he incorporates artillery and Ottoman artillery tactics into, um, in, into his army. Um, But yeah, it's uh, the, the the cultural aversion to to, to musketry and and how uh, and uh, the pr the primacy of cavalry, which is a uh, um, up until which for much of the the period, if you like, is fair. Uh, it's the elite. Although, hmm? To be fair, if we're talking fifteen forties, I know you're saying it goes beyond this, but musketry is far from widespread in Europe at that point either. This is true. This is true. I mean, even up and even in battles in the 17th century, infantry you're talking about, it's at most what one third muskets, as we discussed, because they don't have their nets. So the majority of infantry are pikemen in European armies. Yeah, that 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 that's that's true in the in the in in the 16th century. But the point I'm the point I'm uh, making is that um, even by the 18th century, it's still being um, right. Okay. That that that, that um, the take up of the technology hasn't been as eagerly uh, eagerly done as it as it as it was in as it was in Europe, and that's right. Uh, I see. That that's a. Uh, that's all I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is, um, 1600s, even 1700s. You're still seeing armies turning up with the bow and arrow being the main infantry missile. Bow and arrow, weapon. sword, spears, uh, things that wouldn't have looked out of place in any army um, mm -hmm. uh, from sort of eight from eight hundred years from eight hundred years before. Um, yeah. Just be, simply because of for one reason or another, this uh, um, the adapt the adoption of. Uh, of infantry-based uh, gunpowder weapons just wasn't as quick or as um, or or as popular um, in uh, right. in India, and it's a, I mean, it's it's an argument that can be pushed a little bit too far, but I mean, it's, it's the literature. It it's, seems to be, and I think it's generally correct. The literature generally points to repeated interactions with uh, European-style armies as a way to sort of jumpstart a new development uh, in new institutional development amongst um uh indian uh indian forces be who be whoever they are and it's, it's yeah. again like as as you pointed out it's not um 
in India, it's not uniform. It doesn't happen everywhere all at the same time. Because mm-hmm. um, I know we say India as if it's... As if it's the, as it's, if we're talking about the subcontinent of... Uh, yeah, as if we're talking about the country India. Yeah, there's a lot... Yeah. We're, we're talking about sometimes dozens if we're di- <laughs> of, oh, yeah. of different of, of different uh, of different polities and and and, ki- and kingdoms um, but i mean even even within that to strip it back to the most basic level it's a big place it's oh yeah huge. so obviously there's going to be um differentiations in that respect and different yeah. um terrain as well of course oh completely and um the uh um just because it, and it's and it's a huge deal this this the geographical factor is a huge deal india like america it's massive so um yeah. whereas europe is pretty constricted and a yeah. fractious political and a highly fractious political cockpit mm-hmm. um whereby I, but i i wonder if part of it as well is that um Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I am spitballing. But Europe has this kind of unitary structure to it in that it has, you know, like the Catholic Church and everything is underneath that. And so there's an idea that everyone's in some sense connected to one another, whereas India has a, a multiplicity of religions and ethnicities. ethnicities like I mean, I don't know. It's straining at it. He, he, even if uh, I mean, so by the 16th century, I mean, we've, we're having with uh, Mr. Luther's gone and banged his. Uh, that's true. Banged his 19 point, not not the 19 points. That's that was Woodrow Wilson, wasn't it? 14 points. 19 theses. Is it theses? Theses. Yeah. Not. I'm getting. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting. I'm getting the 14 points and 19 theses mixed up. Yeah. Wrong, wrong war, Harry. Um, about 400 years, uh, yeah, 400 years too, too early. Um, and 19 theses is what tends to happen after an Indian curry, absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. so even if you can unite Europe under the, under the banner of the Catholic Church, if, if you, you need to read, I think one only needs to read about 10 pages about the 30 years' war to realize that it's as, um, that. Politics are defined by confession, uh, as much by dynastic and. Um... Oh, in terms of politics, yeah, I, I mean, in the sense of maybe it's more the printing press actually, but I mean, in terms of information circulating and the transmission of ideas, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, yeah. It's a lot quicker. Um... I mean, you have Latin as a universal language in in Europe, right? Mm-hmm. That everyone who's educated knows how to read and yeah, knows yeah. How to, yeah. to write in, and maybe you don't have anything similar in India. I don't know, and I wouldn't like to, and I wouldn't like to, and I wouldn't like to spitball this because this, uh, this isn't my. Um, yeah, I mean, it is entirely speculation. Yeah, but... yeah, it's, it's it's interesting though. If if the um, yeah, let's leave let's leave that because at this point ne- neither of us knows what neither of us has a clue what we're talking about. No, that is true. That is true. So, Mister B, what happened when? Uh, when gunpowder mm. became cool. Uh, European interlopers arrived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, basic point to make, but it's pretty important, which is although we're talking about Europeans arriving, these are not the first Europeans to ever have contact with India. Sure. Um, the Romans have trade with India, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, St. Thomas one of Jesus Christ's disciples goes to India. Yeah. So one of the first, yeah. So one of the first Christian sects is in India. Um, so yeah, yeah. Although we're talking about, you know, it's labeled as the age of discovery in, um, in certainly old, old histories of this period. Um, we knew it, Europe knew it was there and there had been contact with it before. And in fact, this is the reason why Europeans go there in the first place, because in the 15th century, you have the rise of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire sits pretty much directly on the main route, trade route between Europe and India. Mm -hmm. And so the Ottomans cut off that trade route 
and take it all for themselves, mm. that trade. So the Europeans need to re-establish that. And so um, Portugal ends up leading, leading the charge, as it were. And so Portugal sends a fleet from, from Portugal, from Lisbon, all the way around Africa, rounds the Cape of Good Hope, up into the Indian Ocean, and it arrives in India, uh, led by Vasco da Gama in 1498. So that's sort of the first, that's the first successful European voyage to India. Europeans had been before, but they'd either just sailed down the Red Sea or they'd gone overland through the Middle East. So this is the first oceanic, successful oceanic voyage to India. So the Portuguese initially send a fleet every single year to trade and then to bring the goods back to Europe. Uh, but starting in 1500, they set up a, um, a permanent settlement, a fort, and um, in a place called Cochin, which is on the west coast of India. Okay. In 1502. So they have a small fort there and they're allied with the local um, Cochin kingdom. And what I was going to talk about in the main is the uh, Battle of Coaching, which occurs, do, 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 I think around, yes, it must be 1502 itself. Yeah, because I studied, uh, I was looking at two battles and then I found this one was earlier. Yes, so the Battle of Cochin in 1502. Battle is more of a campaign, actually. So it's between the Kingdom of Cochin and its Portuguese allies on the one side, Right. and the much larger and much stronger kingdom of Calicut on the other. Sure. So Calicut has 60,000 men to um, deploy in this campaign. Uh, it's received large quantities of muskets from the Ottomans. Now, how far they were used and how much they knew how to, with everything you've said, is a separate question. Um, also... Uh, well, that's... that's uh, if... if... I bet if, if, if they were there, they'll have used them. I, I, yeah. I was just using the Mughals as, as kind of a case uh -huh. study where, where, where they weren't as popular. This is brilliant, yeah, yeah because it shows that not everything is not everything is uniform and done, it, done at the same pace and in the same fashion. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, also, um, two agents from Venice had arrived in the Kingdom of Calicut, and they helped forge better artillery, artillery more on a European style. Okay. And they had at least five of these European large cannons. They were still being made in brass. Is that the case in Europe at this point, early 1500s? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. It was in, in 1443, it's when uh, gunsmiths in England, European gunsmiths living in England, work out how to cast cannon in iron. But yeah, that doesn't, mm -hmm. that doesn't bring a halt to them being made in, in brass. Absolutely, right, okay. Absolutely, brass and bronze is, is still... In fact, it's seen as better by, by a lot of people. Oh, right. OK. Yeah. So they have at least five of these European cannons. Um, a point on this, the European cannons were larger than the ones that were manufactured in, in or based on Indian designs. OK. So it's called a battle. It's actually more of a campaign. It's an amphibious campaign. It involves um, naval units and military units. It lasts five months. It goes between March and July. Um, as the army of the Kingdom of Calicut, uh, under its ruler known as the Zamorin, tries to conquer Cochin, um, it fails pretty much. But the um, sort of the key point to look at is the battle at Palignar Ford. So it's so you have a sort of series of islands just off the coast of the Indian mainland. Yeah. And the idea is that the Zamorin has to, you know, conquer all of these one by one, and then he gets to coaching on the furthest one away, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Uh, so he has to take this Paligna, Paligna Ford. So think of it as a kind of Thermopylae, basically. It's a very narrow ford. They need to get across. Um, so he attacks it with 30,000 men and 30 brass cannons. Uh, the Portuguese defending it have 40 men and they have 200 Cochinese allies. So it's 240 against 30,000. Right? Brilliant. 
Yeah, fantastic. So the way it starts is the Portuguese artillery um, defeats the Calicut artillery in an artillery duel. Right. So the Portuguese artillery have complete control of the field. Uh, they then they then directed their fire into the massed Calicut ranks, and these are being held up from crossing the ford by a lot of stakes put up. So you've got to imagine cannonballs smashing in, the men being urged on onwards onto the stakes themselves. All just ma- all on an in, in, in packed in a very dense what could only barely be called a formation being shot at by solid iron balls. Precisely, yeah. That sounds rubbish. Yeah, it does not sound like fun, does it? Negative Ghost Rider. Absolutely. However, uh, weight of numbers eventually told, quite possibly literally, um, and they, they break through the stake line and they're pushing up to the fortifications. At this point, the 200 Cochinese run away which is by far the most sensible thing to do. Yeah, I'd have been gone quite a long time before that, I think. Yep, yep. So the Portuguese are stood there with their artillery, kind of, you know, shaking each other's hands, saying, well, we gave it a good go. And then at that point, like something out of a Hollywood movie, the high tide returns. So the (laughs) ford is flooded and the Portuguese ships can move up. Obviously, by this point, as we discussed in the previous episode, you have artillery on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they open fire on the Calicut troops with their their artillery on the ships. And obviously, that's a bit too much after everything that's been going on. Yeah. For these um, Calicut troops to take and they break and flee. So that's not the... That's not the final battle of the campaign, but it, it pretty much shows you the effect that European style uh, weapons had on, on Indian warfare, on Indian campaigns. I think out of the 60,000 men that Calicut deployed, uh, they lost 19,000 in total over the five month campaign. Now, admittedly, I mean, this is the case with most wars, uh, only 6,000 of those were lost in battle. 13,000 were lost due yeah. to disease. Disease, so, um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, which is pretty much, pretty much classic, really. Do you, um, the, um, do you know how many they lost in that particular... Sorry, what was that battle called? What, what was the battle called? The little uh, Thermopylae battle? Oh, Palignà Ford. Any idea how much they lost there? How many men they lost there? That I haven't, I'm, I haven't, I'm afraid, no. Um... <laughs> No, unfortunately not. But it, it won't have been it won't have been a small amount, put it that way. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the Portuguese are the first to arrive in India uh, from a European standpoint to establish permanent what we'd now call colonial settlements. Yeah. Um, they're all located on the west coast of India. Places like Calicut, Goa is probably the most famous. Um, Portugal conquers that in 1510. It remains Portuguese until the early 1960s. So they have it for quite a long time. Uh, the, Brit- the English, I should say, arrive in India in... Well, the East India Company is formed in 1600. Mm-hmm. It wasn't initially uh, focused on India itself, as the name of the company suggests, East India. It's focused on what we used to call the East Indies, what's now Indonesia. Yeah. Because this was uh, the area that had a lot of spices um, and such things, which were very Pepper popular. Baby. Sorry? Pepper, baby. Pepper, nutmeg, cochineal. Very popular, very expensive in the mm. European market. You see the same in the West Indies. People are going for the sugar and the cotton and the rice that can be cultivated, especially sugar. We're not talking about a war for resources in any way. This is, in many ways, a war for control of luxury goods because they are what will get you the biggest profits. And that's what's driving European expansion. It's not a war for resources at all. It's it's a war for control of, of luxury you know, imagine, I don't know, Louis Vuitton and Gucci sending troops abroad. <laughs> That's sort of what we're talking about here. So the East India Company is formed, as I say, in 1600. Um, it has a major naval victory over the Portuguese, the Battle of uh, Swally or Swally in 1612. 
and this leads them to establish a foothold in India. Um, during the 17th century, British, the English presence is very minimal, uh, mainly because the most powerful European force by this point in India is the Dutch. And in Europe, the English go to war with the Dutch three times in the 1600s, or four times actually, once under Cromwell, three times under Charles II. Every time the English go to war with the Dutch under Charles II, they lose, um, although we did get New York out of it. So, <laughs> but, so on, on this field, the English are very much... Um, very much, as you say, pretty much interlopers is the right word. There are hardly any British, the British, pre the English presence, I should say, is very, very small. You're talking about, you know, a fort in, a fort in Madras, a fort in Calcutta. Uh, the English are given the fort in Bombay by the Portuguese when Charles II marries the daughter of the King of Portugal as a wedding present. Yep, okay. Yep. But that in 1661. But that's it at this point until, as we were mentioning, um, it feeds back into what we were talking about the other week, actually. With 1688, and you have the Glorious Revolution, and the English and the Dutch by, uh, transform at that point from being enemies into being allies. And a lot of Dutch uh, financial developments such as a central banking system a stock market mm. are imported to england as well so the east india company is granted a monopoly on the indian trade within the british market by this point in 1708 which is smack dab in the middle of the war of the spanish succession mm -hmm. which which at that point is the biggest war that europe's known for quite a while and it, as you were saying it's the first you can call it a world war in the sense that it's it's spread out to, to other in continents. terms of military commitment it's probably the yeah, big, exactly. certainly the biggest since the 30 years war um, yeah completely uh, and the, the british government grants monopoly rights to the east india company um initially for three years and the idea is it's to be reviewed after that uh, in exchange for a loan of three point two million pounds, which wow. would have been quite a lot of money back then. That's quite about, a lot. That's easily two years worth of government expenditure. Yeah, yeah, straight away. That's huge. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So from then on, the the Portuguese and the Dutch are pretty much relegated to bit part players. It's the British and the French who are growing more and more in power in India. Um, initially, the French, actually, but the British finally come to power famously in the Battle of Plassey in 1757, which basically grants them control of Bengal, which is, I think, I think the largest province in India, and it might well be the richest as well. But we pretty, but we, the British, pretty much have control of it from 1757 onwards. And I mean, it's it's a point that kind of has to be stressed, and perhaps the people who are sort of casually interested in British imperial history might not realise. In terms of direct control, although we speak about British India and the British Raj and, and things yeah. like that. Um, the, Brit the British, either the East India Company or the Crown, only controlled directly at most one third of what is now India, or what is now India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Obviously, all of that together was British India. The rest of it was still controlled by native Indian rulers that basically acted in alliance with either the East India Company or the British Crown. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Now, in terms of, of warfare, the East India Company develops its own army and its own navy, uh, which, it, which it pays for itself. This is one of the main reasons it's so successful, is that even by granting it the monopoly, the British, gov the British government is making a ton of money on import duty, on customs and excise, and it doesn't have to pay. It's got no outlay in terms of you know, defending the infrastructure and uh, the, what precisely the East India Company are having to pay for to, to get 
to keep this operation going and, and get all the goods back. Precisely, yes. So, yeah. Quick question. The, in the mm -hmm. Battle of um, Plassey, uh, you meant... Plassey, meant, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. 1757. Yeah. Is that British forces against uh, Indian uh, forces or is that against uh, Fre uh, French um, no, it's against it's against Indian forces. Um, so there you know, was you, the. You might have said that. Sorry if you already. No, said no, that. don't worry, don't worry. The Indian army massively outnumbered the British army, even with the British um, Indian allies. They were massively outnumbered. Mm -hmm. But the British commander Robert Clive, um, Clive of India, as he was known to generations of schoolchildren before we stopped thinking imperialism was a good thing. Um, Clive of India has already been in contact with several of the Indian uh, leaders on the opposite side, and they changed sides during the battle. <laughs> and, <laughs> <That's killer. laughs> and also, there is a massive rainstorm uh, right at the start of the battle. The British always keep their gunpowder um, under tarpaulins, just in case this happens. The Indians do not. So the Indians... Gunpowder is ruined. They can't fire their artillery or their muskets. Yeah. yeah. And the British are quite all right. So the Battle of Plassey, there's actually very little military engagement involved in it at all. It's, it's one, of those, um, one of those rare battles where its political impact is way out of proportion to how much fighting actually takes place. If you think that a decisive battle is going to be a you know, a Waterloo with hundreds of thousands of men involved and going yeah. on all day and huge casualty rates. That's not the case with Plassey at all. I think the British casualties barely reach three figures. It's one of those very bizarre battles if yeah. you assume that largeness equals decisiveness. Uh, but from that point, the British are really um, coming into gradually extending their control over India uh, as much through alliance as through conquest, as I say, at mm. most, Britain controlled one directly controlled one third of India. Much easier um, if you get other people to do it for to get other people to do stuff for you. Than, uh... Well, exactly, exactly. It, it's the old sort of um, it's the old sort of thing. I remember hearing someone um, being interviewed on the radio, and he was talking about being bullied at school, and he said, "You just hit the biggest guy." Said because that scares everybody else and then nobody else goes at you you know and that was kind of the british um the british attitude uh so to to give an example of sort of um warfare by this point how how it's how it's developed how indian and european warfare has has developed by the early 1800s uh the main british sort of rival if you like by the early 1800s the french are out of india the portuguese and the dutch are still there but they're not really you know they're not they don't amount yeah. to much so the main enemy is you've mentioned them the maratha empire or maratha confederacy however you want to describe it control an absolutely huge area in india and the british governor general the governor general of the east india company is a man called lord mornington um, Lord Mornington's sort of family name, if you like, is Wellesley, and his oh, brother, him. yeah, and his brother is Arthur Wellesley, who is famous to history as the Duke of Wellington. So, surprise, surprise, Arthur Wellesley is made commander in chief of the British forces in India, and so there's a war between the British and the Marathas. There were three wars in total, actually, and so. Wellington, or Wellesley as he was then, is sent off with an army to fight the, the big army that the Marathas have uh, assembled at a place called Asai, or Asaya. Hey. I'm not entirely sure, Asai, how you entirely pronounce it. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that Wellington's obviously a man who fought an absolutely ton of battles, defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. He always rated as Asai as the toughest battle of his entire career. What, what year was it? 1793, I say? 1803. 1803. 1803, I say, yeah. So the Maratha army numbers about 60,000 men. Wellesley's got about 10,000, maybe just over. So he's very much outnumbered. Now, when I, yeah. say, the Mar <laughs> now, when I say the Maratha army numbers 60,000 men, about 20,000 of this is cavalry 
who will probably just run away right at the start. Right, you know, you'll you'll hire them, but you don't know what on earth they're going to do. There is by this point, I don't know if it's the case with the uh, the Mughal Empire, sort of in the 1500s, 1400s, this would be interesting. But on the Maratha side, there is by this point a, a core regular army that's always in pay, that's armed in a European style, that even has French officers at this point drilling uh -huh. them and training them. Um, but very much, you're, in, in terms of those, they probably barely outnumber the British. And then the rest of it is a huge host of irregulars or light troops or guys who have been dragged out of their villages to, to, come, um, and yeah. to come and fight. Yeah, exactly. So they're essentially positioned between two rivers, but facing as in they're trying to force Wellesley to cross the river and to fight a river battle, essentially, and to fight mm -hmm. him at the crossing of the river. Um, Wellesley works out that there is a ford off to the east. Now, it's not marked on a map or anything like that, but there are two villages directly opposite each other, either side of the river. And Wellesley, who was a very, who had a lot of common sense, said there's no way there's going to be two villages directly opposite each other that have no way of getting to each other. So he sent some cavalry to explore. Sure enough, there was a ford that was shallow enough or infantry to pass across. So he moves his entire army across and essentially outflanks the Maratha line. So they have to form it up again, now in between the two rivers. And then they launch a charge at the British army. This is defeated by the British firepower. When I say the British army, this is a combination of uh, regiments from the British army, regiments from the East India Company army, which tend to be Indian soldiers. Sure. So it, it's, a, it's a mixture of the two. And then, yeah, and then it's just simply a case of superior firepower, but more than that, I think, superior discipline winning the day. These mm -hmm. are very much the kind of the way to look at it. The Marathas are trying to fight a European style battle without European style discipline. So they've got the wet, they've got the, might have the wet, the weapons. But they haven't, yeah. they haven't got the but they haven't got the drills and um precisely yeah. yeah i mean outside that kind of regular army corps they, they don't have anything beyond that i mean even at a say in 1803 you've got some of the maratha troops turning up with bows and arrows like you were saying it's still very in, much... in mutiny uh rebels are still fighting with bows and arrows um yeah yeah it's still very much a part of the um of the kind of military, what would you say, the military the landscape? Military, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, yeah, the sphere, the, the way that it's, um, and also, bows and arrows are cheap. Um, Nicely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's better than nothing, and uh, yeah. you, you can fire, you can shoot them quicker, uh, to be fair. Oh, so absolutely, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so that's that's essentially how, how warfare changes. The Indians do try to the Indians, Indian polities do try to adapt on yeah. the whole by point, using, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. There are a ton of French advisors that are sent to, especially in the 1790s, that are sent to various Indian kingdoms to try and A, turn them against the British and B, as part of that, giving them European style training uh, for, their, for their troops. Uh, but it doesn't prove for whatever reason you know exactly what it is for whatever reason it never proves quite enough the british always have enough troops or the firepower advantage i myself think it's the discipline advantage that really makes the makes the well, um i mean uh, that just maybe shows a different um level of development within the military institutions then if um between between the british and uh the Indian soldiers who, yeah, they're, they're French, uh, they're French technical support. But mm -hmm. if you've only been doing, if you've only been doing it for five years, where, whereas if you're facing an army that's been doing it for, well, by that point, about 150 years, um, yeah. <laughs> um, there's, there's just going to be a whole raft of dynamics that that other, that opposing force will have developed, whereas yours just will not have experience yeah. being one of them, but also just um, 
they're that that opposing force will just be used to doing things in that way and be maybe more adaptable. Um, and yeah, like I said at the start, I think that's just a, a human thing when trying to form new institutions and get large groups of people to do to to do things. Um, mm -hmm, but absolutely. I, but I think you're I think you're absolutely right. The end result is um, one fighting force is more effective than the other when it comes to when it comes to the sharp end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you look at the the British conquest of India, it isn't a conquest at all. I mean, it, it is in certain places. You know, Bengal being perhaps the most obvious, but it, it's mainly a case of alliances. Um, yeah, yeah. Proxy in, and uh, yeah, yeah. Proxy rulers, even the Indian mutiny. The majority of troops fighting against the Indian mutiny are Indians, just yep. of different castes and from different you know areas. Mm -hmm. The Sikhs, who had only been conquered 10 years before, were completely loyal to the East India Company throughout the Indian Mutiny and formed the backbone of the troops that were sent to defeat the Indian Mutiny. The phrase Indian Mutiny suggests it's all India that's taking part in it. Yeah, when yeah, it, yeah. It's not at all. It's, it's very um, localised in, in Indian terms. Obviously, it's, it's over it, hundreds yeah. of miles. Yeah, exactly. But it's very localised geographically. And even in terms of, you know, exact um, sex within Indian society, it's very localised within, within that as well. So it's a bit of a misnomer in many ways to talk about an Indian mutiny. Yeah. But, and as soon as, you know, as soon as the, the British lost the, um, the acquiescence of the people, whether that was given willingly or unwillingly, consciously or unconsciously, as soon as that goes, British rule collapses because there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing to, you know, that was British rule. There's nothing else to hold it in place, really. I mean, there are attempts, obviously. I mean, the Amritsar massacre is the most notable. There are attempts to militarily, yeah, yeah. bolster it with force, but yeah, it's um... exactly, but. Even the attempt of that, even to, to sort of look at it cold-bloodedly and ignore the absolute immorality of it, but even the attempt of that shows just how futile it actually is. Yeah, when you when you're clutching at straws at that, when you've lost the um, acquiescence of any um, people in order to be governed, yeah, you're on you're onto a bit of a always onto a bit of a loser. Precisely, um, precisely. So <laughs> that's the the yeah. Sorry, so that's the transformation. No, no. Of Indian warfare, it's completely changed. Eventually, it's completely changed into a European style. Um, no. As I say, as British rule is extended, as you would expect, this is what happens. And certainly after the Indian mutiny, you have to look to, you know, the Afghan frontier or the, the Burma frontier for mm. different kinds of military tactics or military weapons at that point. Well, I think that's um, just talking of new tactics and new weapons we've already um we we've ended our this uh this week's talk sort of at the end of the 18th century and at the beginning of the 19th century mm -hmm. so i think for ne next week it may be it would be a good idea if we skip back to europe and have a look at napoleon and Ooh, yes. uh, yeah and have a look at the um not just the military, but the institutional upheavals caused by the French Revolution in, uh, oh, in Europe, yes. and how um, and how that goes on to not only affect Europe but also subsequently uh, the rest of the world, including the United, um, including the United States, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so that that will be next week's episode. Um, we'll skip. Um, we'll, we'll be back. It. We'll be back in Europe next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, that's that's all from me. Anything? Uh, anything? No, to add I me? I don't think so. I don't think there's anything in particular to add. Um, I would just say, mm -hmm. in case where I don't know if we're coming back, I'm sure we'll be doing things outside Europe as well. Um, but in terms of European contact, if you like, obviously this technology is already there in India, like we were mm -hmm. saying. Somewhere it's not is Japan. And in the 1500s, a Portuguese trading ship is shipwrecked in Japan. 
with a, um, a crate of muskets or arquebuses, as it would have been then, on board. Yeah. And it's from this that the Japanese and the trading links with the Portuguese that are later established, that the Japanese developed their own uh, gunpowder technology. Well, um, if we head back to, we'll head back to Europe and do Napoleon next week. Yeah. And then we'll, uh, and then the week after that, we'll head out to Japan and have a look at um, some, uh, yeah, the in, um, the effect of gunpowder on Japanese warfare, starting from starting from there and heading into the Meiji Meiji Revolution in eighteen sixty seven. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah that, that, would that, that would leave us chronologically in a, in quite a good place. Sorry, people, yeah. we're just discussing our itinerary. Normally, we do this in a separate meeting, but as you, if this you're still true. listening, then yeah, <laughs> this yeah, is more that's, that's going on. <laughs> now we'll uh we'll, we'll we'll call we'll call it a day there thanks ever so much for tuning in and absolutely thank hope, you hope you all got something out out of this it's been a, and hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed doing it uh and we will see you next week back in uh back in france in 1789 ish mm, absolutely okay guys take care bye everybody bye bye